Hello and welcome to another edition of Bread Theory. I am your chill companion through the world of leftist literature. My name is Zach, and tonight I'm going to be bringing you the audiobook version of Chapter 11 of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin, one of the most famous uh, anarcho-communists in, in the classic leftist literature. And tonight I'll be joined by my guest, uh, Jared Anderson. He's someone I know through uh, one of my Facebook groups that I, I run, um, Left Signal Boost. So he's going to help me out and, and have add in, uh, add in his own commentary. So without any further ado, I'm going to give him a call on Skype. Give Jared a call right now. Here we go. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Not bad. How are you doing? Uh, it's going going pretty well. Yeah. 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 You enjoying this uh, Mother's Day weekend? Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Yeah. Yeah. Plan on getting together with uh, my mom tomorrow, and then my my wife's mom on Sunday. So it should be should be a good time. Some some good hey. weather up here in Minnesota. Uh, whereabouts of the country are you from? I'm uh, right outside Richmond, Virginia. Oh, Richmond. Very cool. All right. Uh, well, if you would, please, uh, for the audience, give them your pronouns and then as much of your biography as you care to share. Cool. Yeah, um, I'm Jared. I'm uh, uh, My pronouns are they, them. Um, and uh, I'm a game developer, uh, parent, and um, a uh, and a uh, communist of sorts. I'm not exactly sure where along the lines I fall. Sure. Oh, it's no big deal. Because, We're all on a journey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Still figuring, learning more. For but sure. yeah. Very cool. All right. Uh, so, what what brought you to the world of leftism? Is that something that you grew up with, or did you did you come to it on your own? Um, I was brought up in a very conservative background uh i kind of dabbled in um i heard that marx was like uh the devil incarnate oh, man. so when I was about 14 i read a communist manifesto and then <laughs> i sort of started started gravitating towards it until i um i think i came upon uh is it american american john Bron oh, wait the dude uh yeah. with lula um, yeah american johnson interesting yeah, name that he that he's got there yeah yeah <laughs> But um, he he brought up uh, anarcho communism and uh, um, Peter Kropotkin as well, um, so I checked out some of his stuff through that, um, and uh, yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of how I how I got there. Very cool, very cool. Well, I'm so happy that uh, you had the time to join me tonight. Uh, once again, we're going to be doing the chapter eleven of the Conquest of Bread. Is that a book that you've read before yourself, or are you, are you new to it? Oh yeah, yeah. I've read um, *Conquest of Bread* and um, yeah, a few times by by Kropotkin. Oh nice, yeah. very good, very good. So you're familiar with the the all for all and the investing the revolution in the in the revolutionaries and all that that sort of jazz. Right. Yeah. Very cool. Well, the the topic for this chapter is going to be free agreement. So uh, I it's been it's been probably almost a year since I've actually read this book. So. From what I remember, this is going to be about more or less uh, the the new arrangement rather than than uh, like the, a business contract or or any of the old styles of of you know one side being uh, having more leverage over over the other side in in any sort of agreement. It's more like free association that will be the the norm under Kropotkin's um, new system. That's what yep. I yeah. So cool. Well, uh, what do you say we get into it? Yeah, sounds good. All right. Well, let's go. And if any, anyone in the chat has any questions, not necessarily going to be able to get to them. It does take a while to get through these these chapters. All this this one's actually pretty short. I didn't realize how short it was. Perhaps we'll even get to chapter twelve. We'll have to see how long chapter twelve is. I didn't realize. Oh, chapter twelve is quite a bit longer. <laughs> so maybe we'll do this, and uh, um, we'll, we'll just kind of see how this one goes, and. Um, if we have more time, maybe we can uh, answer more questions or just, you know, hang out and chat or anything like that. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Well, let's get going with uh, tonight's audiobook, um, The Conquest of Bread, Chapter 11, 
free agreement. This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin Chapter 11 Free Agreement Accustomed as we are, by hereditary prejudices and absolutely unsound education and training, to see government, legislation, and magistracy everywhere around, we have come to believe that man would tear his fellow man to pieces like a wild beast the day the police took his eye off of him. That chaos would come about if authority were overthrown during a revolution. And with our eyes shut, we pass by thousands and thousands of human groupings which form themselves freely without any intervention of the law and attain results infinitely superior to those achieved under government tutelage. If you open a daily paper, you find its pages are entirely devoted to government transactions and to political jobbery. A Chinaman reading it would believe that in Europe nothing gets done save by order of some master. You find nothing in them about institutions that spring up, grow up, and develop without ministerial prescription. Nothing, or hardly nothing, even when there is a heading, sundry events. It is because they are connected with the police. A family drama, an act of rebellion, will only be mentioned if the police have appeared on the scene. 350 million Europeans love or hate one another, work or live on their incomes. But, apart from literature, theater, or sport, their lives remain ignored by newspapers if governments have not intervened in some way or other. It is even so with history. We know the least details of the life of a king or of a parliament, all good and bad speeches pronounced by the politicians have been preserved. Quote, speeches that have never had the least influence on the vote of a single member, unquote, as an old parliamentarian said. Boy, and how that has not changed at all. I mean, <laughs> you look at any history class, it's all the great battles of history. It's not even, even the, the day-to-day -day affairs of, of most of the people, unless it's particularly scandalous or anything like that. It's, it's these, these huge, uh, you know, earth-shattering events. You don't really hear as much about the, the average person and, and what their daily life was like. How, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, I think he's just going over, um, so how the hierarchical structure is normalized, mm -hmm. um, how we're taught to accept it, and that, uh, yeah, like you were saying, um, uh, they... The day-to-day -day lives of ordinary citizens isn't really reported unless there's some sort of intervention or if it has direct, uh, directly as associated with, with the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Th things would probably look a lot different if we had that, that full and, and rounded picture of, of right. people's lives. And, and sometimes it's hard, like as a historian living in the, the modern era, I imagine it's hard to come by uh, a lot of the everyday objects and... and you know, rec records if they don't, didn't even exist in the first place. But today there's no real excuse for that sort of thing. Right. And especially in the, in the U S right. Like mm -hmm. the, the history that we're taught is, uh, separate from the, the reality that we exist in. Yeah. Oh, that, that's very true, man. That, I, I can't believe that the stuff that, that children are, are taught in American history books these days, how they've sanitized things so much. I, I saw this one image of a book where it was like, uh, they talked about Native American removal, uh, the Native American Removal Act, and they, they titled it Moving On Out. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> the, the yeah, natives did, did realize there was lots of white people around, so they just decided to be nice and move on to a different part of the country. It's like, oh my God. Like, Yikes. how how sanitized, <laughs> how whitewashed can you actually make history? Yeah. And, and I suppose for most people, they just take it for granted their whole life and they don't really question it that much. But I would imagine that there's a sizable portion for whom once they find out that was a lie, they start to wonder what else is a lie. And they just start pulling sure. on that thread and it just starts unraveling, you know, piece yeah, after piece. Yeah, I count myself among those. <laughs> yeah, I, I would too. Like, like even among, even uh, thinking of things like just considering communism or, or any sort of leftist uh, theory, anarchy, whatever it be, it was something that just was taken for granted, even up through high school, that uh, that's just, you know, not even worth considering. It, it's been tried, you know, they, they do all these, these <laughs> kind of thought-stopping expressions, it's been tried, or it, or it leads to famine, or, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Right. 
quotes and that, from the black book coming. Yeah, basically. And 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 that that works for a while, but but at some point, you know, I just kept thinking and questioning and then like, you know, I've I've now found that that, that was that was totally untrue and there's a, there's a whole other side to that that picture of history that they they just conveniently leave out for one reason or another. I I'm I'm assuming it's not necessarily for any malice, it's just the way that they were brought up and the way that they were taught in whatever school they went to to become a teacher. That you know, this is this was actually the history and stuff like that. And these ideas are not worth considering. All that, all that sort of thing. Sure. Yeah. Sorry, are you saying there was no malice on the part of the teachers regurgitating yeah. the things that they were taught? Or yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Like, I, I wouldn't oh, necessarily yeah. okay. say that my my history teachers were trying to keep anything from me. Like, they knew some some right. deeper secret. I just think they they themselves hadn't bothered to to really wander past that or, or take an honest look from a source that that wasn't biased towards uh, maintaining capitalism in one way or another. Yeah, Which yeah, is... and I think that's like why it's important to go into. Um, looking through history from the lens of of uh, different different publications on theory, because uh, like w- the amount of propaganda that we get dealt like every 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 day, and then also just from from birth, essentially, um, especially in the U.S. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a lot to be said for just kind of not being aware of the waters that you swim in, really, like. Uh... It's, it's, it's hard to step outside your own experience and, and really understand, you know, all the factors that affect your own life and, and, and guide your decisions and have potentially uh, put you on a very narrow path, even though you've been told your whole life that as long as you keep your head down and work, you can do whatever you want. You can be, you can climb that corporate ladder, whatever, get, get those uh, symbols of status that, you, that you're looking after. Um, but but yeah, it it, it uh, it's it's hard to see that if you don't step outside. Um, have have you traveled at all in your in your time? Uh not not so much. Yeah, I haven't even been to a lot of parts of of this country, um, let alone uh, other countries. <laughs> oh. Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. How about yourself? I, I've I've done a little bit of traveling. I I've, I did study abroad in New Zealand for uh, a semester, and that was amazing. And that and that's what I was kind of trying to get at is that one, that was an experience for myself at least, where I stepped outside of my own experience, and and I was able to see all these different perspectives. I was able to see, you know, the 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 fingerprints, the handprints of uh, basically English or British colonialism. Uh, being in, in New Zealand, which was, I believe their highest card is still the, uh, I don't know if it's the Queen or, or if it's the, the House of Lords or whatever it is, but it still has its connections to uh, the UK. And so it's just interesting to see the, the way that they've shaped so much of the world in, in their own image, really. Um, right. So that was, that was an interesting experience for me. And I've done a little traveling. I, I was fortunate enough to, to, you know, as a as a child to go on a few family vacations to different parts of the country and stuff like that. But yeah, travel is one of those things, but you know, in this day and age, it's, it's possible to get all kinds of perspectives without even leaving your home, which is, it's, you know, double-edged sword, but it can definitely be something to, um, if you're looking to expand your view, you know, it can definitely be a good way of doing that. So, yeah. All right, well, let's continue on a little bit here. Royal visits, good or bad humor of politicians, jokes or intrigues, are all carefully recorded for posterity. But we have the greatest difficulty to reconstitute a city of the Middle Ages, to understand the mechanism of that immense commerce that was carried on between Hanseatic cities, or to know how the city of Rouen built its cathedral. If a scholar spends his life in studying these questions, his works remain unknown and parliamentary histories, that is to say, the defective ones, as they only treat one side of social life, multiply, are circulated, are taught in schools. And we do not even perceive the prodigious work accomplished every day by spontaneous groups of men, which constitutes the chief work of our century. We therefore propose to point out some of these most striking manifestations, and to prove that men, as soon as their interests do not absolutely clash, act in concert harmoniously and perform collective work 
of a very complex nature. It is evident that in present society, based on individual property, that is to say, on plunder, and on a narrow-minded and therefore foolish individualism, facts of this kind are necessarily few in number. Agreements are not always perfectly free, and often have a mean, if not execrable, aim. But what concerns us is not to give examples which we could blindly follow, and which, moreover, present society could not possibly give us. What we have to do is prove that, in spite of the authoritarian individualism which stifles us, there remains in our life, taken as a whole, a great part in which we only act by free agreement, and that it would be much easier than we think to dispense with government. So, so in this, I, what I see is, is Kropotkin kind of laying out his, his view on human nature. It's become very popular to believe that human nature is, is to be self-interested or even outright selfish to, you know, get away with as much as you want. You know, lasers, uh, work your, workers, that is, will be as lazy as, as they uh, can get away with. Um, they will take as much money as they can get away with. And, and that sets up the, the sort of class antagonism that Marx likes to talk about between the employer and, and the employees. Um, but Kropotkin says, he kind of he turns that on its head and he says, no, that's only because of, of these, these old systems and the way that people have hoarded power and, and basically forced people to, to enter into uh, uneven agreements where they hold all the cards as the, the employer and uh, the workers basically don't have a choice. It's, it's framed as a choice. You, you can always choose to go to a different master, but uh, when it comes down to it, they don't exactly have that choice. And if they did, that, that people would just keep on working. Um, one of the biggest criticisms of leftism is that if you just give people all the stuff they need, well, they'll, they'll just uh, be lazy and, and sit around and uh, nothing will get done, no work will get done. Um, I tend to not really agree with that. Um, what, what is your view on that? Jared, how do, how do you feel that, that Kropotkin's shaping human nature, and do you feel it's realistic the way that he's putting it out? I think so, yeah. I mean, we are a communal uh, species. I think that we, are, if if humans have some sort of innate nature, then it's to um, take care of each other, essentially. And um, it, it's capitalism that bastardizes that and separates us from our humanity and uh, puts us into a situation where we are not only uh, exploited, but we're also taught to exploit. And it teaches us to basically it teaches us to act on in the worst ways towards each other. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think often it's, it's kind of because there's, there's no real choice. I mean, uh, you look at the people that end up getting into things like, uh, drug dealing and, and, and violent crime and, and stuff like that. Not, not to say setting aside drug use, that kind of is, is pretty uniform among all classes and, and uh, income levels, but just the people that are doing the resorting to um, at least certain types of criminal activity. And it's, I mean, in, in my mind, it's because they just don't have a lot of real choice. They don't have a meaningful alternative if their schools are underfunded or if they just have never been given any sort of opportunity to do anything different and they've just been, I guess, structurally held back um, in a way. It's not, it's not exactly a choice at that point. You, it's basically you do this thing that, that you may not even agree with, um, you may not like the, the outcome of, but at least you get to eat, at least you get to keep having money coming in or, or you, <laughs> you don't. Right. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, okay. Let's let's uh, let's move on with the the program here. In support of our view, we have already mentioned railways, and we are about to return to them. We know that Europe has a system of railways, one hundred seventy-five thousand miles long, and that on this network you can nowadays travel from north to south, from east to west, from Madrid to Petersburg and from Calais to Constantinople, without stoppages, without even changing carriages when you travel by express. More than that, a parcel thrown into a station will find its addressee anywhere, in Turkey or in Central Asia, without more formality needed for sending it than writing its destination on a bit of paper. This result might have been obtained in two ways, a Napoleon, a Bismarck, or some potentate, 
having conquered Europe, would from Paris, Berlin, or Rome draw a railway map and regulate the hours of the trains. The Russian Tsar Nicholas I dreamt of taking such action. When he was shown rough drafts of railways between Moscow and Petersburg, he seized a ruler and drew on the map of Russia a straight line between these two capitals, saying, here is the plan. And the road as was built in a straight line, filling in deep ravines, building bridges of a giddy height, which had to be abandoned a few years later at a cost of about 120,000 to 150,000 pounds per English mile. This is one way, but happily things were managed differently. Railways were constructed piece by piece, the pieces were joined together, and the hundred diverse companies to whom these pieces belonged came to an understanding concerning the arrival and departure of their trains and the running of carriages on their rails from all countries without unloading merchandise as it passes from one network to another. All this was done by free agreement, by exchange of letters and proposals, by congresses at which delegates met to discuss certain special subjects, but not to make laws. After the Congress, the delegates returned to their companies, not with a law, but with the draft of a contract to be accepted or rejected. There were certainly obstinate men who would not be convinced, but a common interest compelled them to agree without invoking the help of armies against the refractory members. I'm just going to pause it there for one second. Um, I don't remember where I read it, but, but I seem to remember just somewhere in the back of my brain uh, when they talked about I remember learning about the development of railways in the United States um, and how at the beginning there was a, like a whole bunch of different gauges of track. So it's like the, the width of uh, the um, pieces of track apart from each other, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. And at the beginning, that was that was intentional because then you come up to the end of the railway. You have to unload all your cargo and, and put it onto a train that can accommodate the, the different type of, of track. Uh, but just eventually people got sick of that and then through agreements or through buying out or through one means or another, they, they standardized everything. And it, and it sounds like this is kind of what he's talking about uh, taking place in Europe where people could have been very petty and they could have been very self-interested or even selfish um, to the point of sabotaging one another uh, just to, to squeeze a little bit more money out of their own particular uh, length of track, but, but instead they didn't. And I think what he's, he's trying to get at is that you don't have to have these, these large, violent, coercive forces to, to make people act in ways that are beneficial for not just themselves, but everyone who relies on, on whatever it is that they are doing, whether that's, that's transportation or, or food distribution or, or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. And these, these are competing companies as well that were able to right. make these these agreements without direct oversight and without uh, coercion from, from the state. Mm -hmm. And they did it for the, for um, mutual, mutual benefit, <laughs> mutual yeah. benefits, but also for the, it benefited the people at large as well. So, yeah. So I think he's just kind of trying to use that as, as an example, like a, I guess it's kind of in the macro, like he, he focused mostly on um, particular cities and, and places of production and saying how, the exchange would just naturally happen, you know. You, you have people see that they need food in one part of the city. Um, you happen to be a farmer. You have a lot of food that you've produced. You're going to take it to where it needs to go, um, whether that's through these distribution networks that he thinks would just spontaneously pop up, or whether that's just you know through word of mouth, decide you know figuring out where things need to go, and then in exchange, um, having the confidence to be able to like walk into any shop and, and get the things that you need as a farmer to keep doing your work and to, to survive and, and even do what, what he talked about in the leisure chapter, you know, pursue your own interests. So, so maybe you go into a place that manufactures microscopes and you, you pick yourself out one and, and because you've given food to a bunch of people and everyone knows that everyone's helping each other out, that it, it just kind of works out where people manage to manufacture the stuff that they need and, and, without any sort of money, without any sort of extra complications of things, without any hierarchy, really, things just kind of sort themselves out because man kind of just acts like a, almost like an, an, an ant colony, you know, and not quite as, as programmed, but, you know, they just get things done through the, just the natural uh, goings about through their daily life and, and doing the things that they do to um, produce stuff, basically. Uh, what are right. your what are your thoughts on this chunk here? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I 
I think I agree. Um, there's, yeah, I mean, it goes back to just humans being naturally communal. And as a species, we, um, we tend to look to help each other out more than, uh, screw each other over. Um, I, I don't know if we're <laughs> <laughs> Christmas. Um, but, uh, yeah. um, given that, like, I mean, it, it, it is capitalism that reverses that and teaches us that we need to, um, exploit others uh, and at, um, at all points in order to basically survive. Mm -hmm. Um, like even, even just mundane interactions with, with capitalism makes us, uh, forces us to make choices that, um, are to the detriment of the like global working class. As far as like, if you order off Amazon, you're most likely buying something that was produced by underpaid labor in unsafe conditions, quite possibly. And, things of that sort but um but it's it's capitalism that does that if humans were left right. on their own they would be able to uh put together a system that would benefit benefit the many um rather than being coerced by the state and capital to uh to uh make decisions that are to the detriment of uh, themselves and each other mm-hmm yeah, and, and so Kropotkin's talking about a very self-organizing, kind of self-regulating system where uh, people just kind of naturally know what's going on. They all believe in the cause of the revolution um, to provide for all the, their basic needs and, and to give all, you know, the all for all basically goes in, in both directions. You give whatever you have to the people that need it. You take what you need from the people that, that have it. Uh, not, in a, not in a coercive or a violent way, just, just because that's what everyone does with each other. It's just part of a a natural society. Um, now, it, it, you, you mentioned you're coming more from a, a communist background. Is that was? Did I hear you right there? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 correct. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, w- if you were looking at a society like this, would 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 you think that there would be more of a need, perhaps, for centralized distribution of the, these sorts of things or or do you think that it's it's possible to just kind of you know almost laissez-faire just kind of let things happen as they do um that that is a very good question i yeah. think um i might lean more towards the marxist Leninist interpretation mm-hmm. um that we need to go through a set of uh phases to make sure things mm. get to where they need to be um rather than uh, just the the end state of a classless, moneyless, uh, yeah. stateless. That's quite society. the leap from um, this point, yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I, th- I think that 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 sort of um, that so sort of um, autonomy is uh, is the end goal. Um, mm-hmm. But p- perhaps there would need to be some form of provisional government or, uh, you know, dictatorship of the proletariat mm-hmm. sort of thing um, to to get us to where we would need to be there. Yeah, that, that's that's one of the concepts that Marx laid out, um, and we went through it when I did the the uh, the Communist Manifesto. It just it just a brief part in that book, but it, it means so much. It's been debated so much, and that's the dictatorship of the proletariat, which I think is a really poorly named uh, concept, at least in posterity. Right, dictatorship and like, yeah oh, <laughs> people think of a strong man people think of, of you know khrushchev uh, uh banging his his uh, his uh shoe on on the on the podium saying we will bury you and you know all these sorts of things or, or you know it's very iron-fisted um autocrats but but no that's not at all what marx meant he meant literally the proletariat meaning all the workers together make these decisions about distribution and 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 production and and all the uh, important parts of uh, society, um, but that's 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 where I always struggle myself as is coming as it's kind of leaning more towards the anarchist side. Is how do you get to that point where you've accumulated enough power into the hands of of whoever's being the revolutionary, the, the, the vanguard party, or whatever it is, whoever's toppled the the powers that be. Once you've accumulated right. all that power, how do you make sure that it doesn't just flow towards a few of the key players in, in whatever revolution there is? Like, like how do you guard against it? How do you get to the point? Because I would love to see a dictatorship of the proletariat. I, I, that's basically what we're, I mean, it's, it's 
such a small difference between what Kropotkin is, is really talking about that right. it's, it's more because just the, formalized the, versus kind of informed. Bas- that's, yeah. that's basically the difference. Yeah, the idea being that like one would flow into like that. Kropotkin's vision would ultimately be the natural um, the natural evolution of yeah, that. Like kind the, of the, the, the state result. withering away and the people just kind of going off on their own, doing the things they've been doing, correct? Right. Yeah. And that that's 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 a really good question. Um, I think it's an important question, especially like in in today's age versus that of Kropotkin and Marx. Um, we are faced with like unavoidable damage to the climate. Um, oh, that's for sure. So if we don't if we don't make like really extreme changes, we're we're probably all going to be um, you know. Toast. Yeah, <laughs> pretty, like, bad, pretty yeah. literally toast. Yeah, <laughs> not, not so well. Um, and it's going to be even even harder to to um to bring forth a a united working class that can can bring this to fruition because yeah um as as the state seeks to gain more power um and even even in the U.S. recently, like the anti-protesting laws and things of that sort, mm-hmm. like that that'll that'll keep happening. And <laughs> May Day gang change to a loyalty day. Um, oh, the, the, what a what an unnecessary like kick in the face to the labor movement. Right. Yeah, that was wild. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> Changing it to loyalty day, like you didn't even need that. They've already made an artificial Labor Day in September. Why did you need to like cover over that one thing? Like Biden came in with all these promises of, of having better relations with, with labor. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> that just seems like an unforced error. Like what, what was he thinking? I mean, I, I'm sure you don't know what he's thinking either. Like it's, it's ridiculous yeah. <laughs> sort of logic that you'd have to get to, but man, that, that pissed me off a lot. Really. Yeah. Same. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so in, in your readings of, of theory, and it seems like you've, you've read a little bit, probably maybe even more than I have, um, at least on the, the communist side, what are, what are the different thoughts that, that you've heard to get away from these strongman dictatorships or, or at least guard against them when, when they try and assert themselves, uh, in, in, in a communist sort of a revolution? And perhaps you haven't heard anything like that. I don't mean to put you on the spot or anything, but just have you heard anything? I'll put it that way. <laughs> um, good are question. you familiar with any ideas? Yeah, I think. Um, I think as long as um, as long as a, a true dictatorship of the proletariat is maintained, um, mm-hmm. then we shouldn't necessarily need to worry so much about um, about a. In, certain individuals just gaining too much power and then abusing that power as as people with power tend to do um right but uh yeah um yeah i'll have to, <laughs> I'll have oh, that's to read right. up somewhere and oh. come back to that <laughs> yeah yeah well you know and, and and hopefully um we'll be able to have you back on on the program at, at, at later times as well you know when we dive into more of that theory that that goes into that because I'm, I'm very much inter- interested in that, too. Um, I think the next book in my series is, is going to be uh, Principles of Communism by, by Engels. Is that one that you've read at all? I have not, actually. I don't think I've read any of Engels yet. Yeah, I think he kind of gets short shrift when it comes to uh, the whole Marxist <laughs> is, is web Engels of ideas. Is Engels the um, egoist, or is that a, am I thinking of another person? Well, yeah, I mean... Um, I don't know if he ever was considered an egoist. I, I guess I don't know enough about his particular philosophy because everything just gets centered around Marx instead of Marx and Engels. Um, right. But, but any, anyway, in, in the principles of communism, he basically lays out what most people believe uh, the communist manifesto is going to be when they go into it. You know, just kind of a point by point. This is what we're thinking of when we want to, to do uh, a socialist or a communist revolution. This is how it would look afterward. These are the different institutions that would that would crop up. Um, these are the different ways we would organize ourselves, oh. all that sort of thing. So, so yeah, I think that'll be my I'm, next one, and that's and that's pretty short. Uh, I'm sorry, did you have something you wanted to, to add to that part? Oh, 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I just wanted to jump in. Um, yeah, please. <laughs> I just googled. I just googled Ingalls. Um, yeah, I definitely have read Ingalls before. Um, he, he, I guess he, um, he wrote uh, the Communist Manifesto with with Marx. Um, right. So yeah, yeah, I, I have. I have have read him and he's not the egoist that i was thinking of oh, okay. that's a okay. different person <laughs> i mean the, the, a lot of those yeah. names kind of to blur together when, once you get enough of them <laughs> out of the way <laughs> <laughs> so we have some uh uh some comments coming in in the chat here uh let's see and western hegemon which i would agree with that title um to stop communism they should have or to stop the communists they should have borders red fascism was a real thing Okay, that's that's a pretty broad statement. Not quite sure. No nation should have borders. Oh, they shouldn't have borders. I misread that. My mistake. No nation should have borders. Uh, when it comes to theory, I would hit up Alexander Dugan. Oh, that's another name that I, I haven't really uh, explored at all. But but thank you very much for the suggestion. I will definitely look into that. And you know that's the thing about theory, especially older theories. You know, you can kind of go into it endlessly and. There's always one more person, one more book that you can can get to, and I kind of like that. That there's just so much. It's such such, such a rich and varied body of, of of work. It's really a shame that it's it's not more widely studied. Even as an academic, you know, you don't have to like be teaching kids. This is the one and only way to think about any of the things that you teach them. But but at least expose them to the ideas that there's other stuff out there, and these are what people have have said and and thought about it. I think that would be. I mean, how could that be a bad thing, really? Especially in, in, you know, our very much free speech, you know, don't censor me sort of <laughs> America that we live in these days. Um, yeah, so, oh, uh, so getting back to what I was talking about in the, the, the sequence of things, after I get through kind of these basics here, like the conquest of bread is, is um, pretty foundational. Um, so was Communist Manifesto. So was Principles of Communism. I'll probably do like a, a short anarchist text maybe maybe a couple pamphlets or something just to balance things out and then i want to get into things like state and revolution and and some nice. of the more the stuff that that really you know i hear time and time again when people are like what energized you what what convinced you most of all to to come to the left or come to one particular ideology or, or another i think i'll get into stuff like state and revolution so and I, I've forgotten what <laughs> what the beginning of that that train of thought was, but um, anyway, that's where it's ended up. I'm oh, getting some more comments here. Let's see what we got. That's for me, actually. I'm sorry, I didn't oh, to interrupt you. I'm no just, problem. Uh, slightly antagonizing. <laughs> okay. Oh, so so um, you know so you know a little bit about Dugan. I'm I'm somewhat familiar. I haven't read up on him enough, but um, but yeah, I I have heard that he's been aligned with our um. Yeah, he's uh, just according to a quick Google res uh, result, is a Russian political analyst and strategist known for his fascist views. He reportedly has close ties with the Kremlin and Russian military, although it has been disputed. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, I've I've heard I've heard mixed things on Dugan. I haven't I haven't personally read into his uh, his text. I was just curious as to uh, end Western hegemonies uh, hegemonies. I, thoughts on that but <laughs> very cool very cool um so kind of thinking about different texts what have, what have been some of the texts that you found you know really got you going or, or were really important even though they were kind of dry that that could also be an interesting thing um yeah actually one that you one that you mentioned um state and revolution mm, by Vladimir well, there you go. yeah um it's pre prequel um blood in my eye uh oh i don't know that one it's um blood in my eye was by uh, george jackson um okay i've heard the name at least was, yeah it was basically a dude who was um writing it I, I believe most of it was uh written um from from prison um oh cool but and someone who i, I as far as I can recall, um, went into Marxist Leninism uh, while within the prison system um, in in the U.S. Um, and uh, and then more of a uh, Kropotkin. Uh, I've read a uh, Mutual Aid. Uh, yeah, I've, I would definitely like to get to that like, one. Evolution of the Species. Right. Yeah. Um, Very nice. And um, and then uh, yeah, Communist Manifesto, uh, Das Kapital. Uh, yeah. 
I'm, no I'm, not, I'm not looking too forward to Das Kapital. <laughs> I've, I've heard at least uh, Mark's Madness's uh, read through of it and their synopsis, and even the synopsis. Boy, does it get dry and boring in places, or, or even most <laughs> of what they were talking about. But yeah, that's one of those ones that that's really, it, it's really important at least. But it's man, that's going to be a slog to get through that. Like, you know, even even uh, this is a relatively short book, The Conquest of Bread. Um, but it, it's taken now, I think, three, maybe maybe four months to to get as far as we have, and we're not even all the way through yet. Um. So yeah, but oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Go 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 on with the the other texts that have been influential to you or or really good. Oh, you're good. Um, yeah, I think that's. I think that's like most of them. Um, Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still, still going through and reading stuff. Um, Oh, oh, I actually just recently uh, went through and did like a little bit of a um, uh, dissection on and like discussion with, with others on um, Terman Mao's. It's just like a a short paper, but um, combating or combat liberalism. Combat Uh, liberalism. That's one that I've been hearing coming up a lot lately. Oh, nice. Yeah, I would absolutely suggest that. Um, I can send you some links if you want. It's on the Marxist uh, Marxist Collective, I think. Um, It's provided there, and I'm sure you can probably find it elsewhere as well. Uh, But it's super short and uh, packs a lot in terms of what it's communicating. Cool. Basically, the the synopsis is just uh, liberalism is the preservation of self, mm-hmm. and Marxism is the uh, putting the needs of the revolution and and the people above yourself, and uh, and wow. uh, using that to combat liberalism. Wow, but, that that sounds really powerful. That's yeah, cool. yeah, it's really, really neat. I would definitely and have to again, add that like, to the list. Super short. It's like the opposite of Das Kapital. <laughs> which, which, if you covered that on your Twitch stream, it would probably take. <laughs> oh <you forever>. boy. <laughs> yeah, I think that maybe that's something that I'll have to wait until maybe the winter because I, I, I actually just uh, accepted a, a landscaping job for the summer. Um, oh, nice. So I'm actually excited about it. it's it's a company I've worked for before, and uh, they do a lot of the the big properties in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, but the thing about landscaping, especially in Minnesota, is is that it's very seasonal. So it'll be work until maybe November if I'm lucky, and then I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do beyond that. And I've been kind of toying with the idea of um, taking on the they do uh, snow removal in the winter, uh, but then most of the workers, because the the work is so sporadic, they have to go on unemployment, which might not be such a bad thing if I can use that time then to uh, do Twitch more often. So maybe oh. I could, maybe if it, maybe if I do end up doing that, then I'll be able to tackle some of these, these, <laughs> these more tome like texts. And you yeah, know, I can just do like one, I can do like marathon streams. Oh, could you imagine 16 straight hours? <laughs> <That's capital. laughs> I don't know if even I could, could handle that. <laughs> I think my brain would be pretty mashed up by the end of that. But but yeah, so that, that's definitely something I'm considering for, for later on. But, you know, so much to get into, so many, so many good works to get out there. It's, it's, it's overwhelming, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's really fun. It's been a lot of fun going through these texts and seeing people's different for perspectives on it and generating discussion and stuff like that. So I really do like it a lot. So either way, I'll keep going. I'll just keep on plowing through year after year or whatever. <laughs> As long as this thing stays together. Uh, but anyway, nice. we're get, uh, getting some more uh, comments in the chat. Uh, some more from N Western Hegemony. Uh, so saying that, um, uh, I forgot what you were referring to, but you're talking about how that's what the West thinks about. Um, oh. oh uh, about Tegan, I believe. And yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, and that communism is Western. That That definitely is true. And I do plan on covering... Some some non-Western sources. I would like to get to as many as, as possible too, because you know we could use perspectives from all around the world and all sorts of different cultures. There's a whole wealth out there that that doesn't get covered even in you know different podcasts and 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 uh, Twitch streams or what what have you. Uh, a whole lot of stuff that that gets overlooked, and and I definitely like to dig into that stuff as well because there's a lot of valuable stuff. I would love to get into things like uh, the Zapatista movement. Nice. Um, yeah. and, and the experience of Rojava, 
um, take take a closer look at uh, the anarchists um, during uh, Franco's rule. Yeah, that's like one of my favorite mm-hmm. time periods. That that sounds awesome. Yeah, and, and there was just a, a someone in, in chat the last time I streamed who mentioned uh, the Black Army, which I wasn't really even familiar with at all. And they they apparently were out. Oh, I want to say the Ukraine, um, right around the time of of the communist revolution, and they ended up getting into conflict with the Red Army at different points. And that, mm-hmm. that was just something I was totally unfamiliar with. But, yeah, I think wasn't weren't they associated uh to an extent with was that uh trotsky or no could, it wasn't trotsky it was another that. figure i i'll have to look him up again um it was someone who i hadn't heard of before but apparently he was i mean from from the accounts from his own followers he sounded like the real deal when it comes to anarchist thought and and just mm-hmm. blowing aside all the the old prejudices of the past and, and that sort of thing nice um, i think i think uh i've heard i've definitely listened to their uh they're like Anthem, uh, which is a uh, mother anarchy loves her sons or something along those lines. Yeah, um, I think that I think that's connected to that. The right. Black Army. They had the flag that, that kind of looks like the, the Jolly Roger where it's got like the, mm-hmm. the skull yeah. and crossbones. So that, that's right. that sounds really interesting. I love to dig into that sort of thing. There's so many so many avenues I like to take this this stream. Um, but yeah. All right. Uh, oh, boy, I got some more stuff. Oh, no, I think we already covered that stuff. All right. Well, I think we can continue on with the book here. We're already almost through the chapter, unfortunately. Um, if you want, we can go into the next chapter, or we could just kind of open it up and discuss whatever. It's, it's kind of... I'll, I'll leave it up to you and, and, and how much you, are, you wanted, how much time you would like to devote to tonight, because I don't want to weigh on your time either. Oh, sure. Yeah, concerned. no worries. Um, I'm, I'm, my schedule is pretty much cleared off, so... Cool, cool, awesome. Well, let's just continue here, and then we'll, we'll see what we feel like uh, once we get to the end. Sounds this good. immense network of railways connected together and the enormous traffic it has given rise to no doubt constitutes the most striking trait of our century, and it is the result of free agreement. If a man had foreseen or predicted it 50 years ago, our grandfathers would have thought him idiotic or mad. They would have said, never will you be able to make the shareholders of a 100 companies listen to reason. It is a utopia, a fairy tale. A central government with an iron director can alone enforce it. And the most interesting thing in this organization is that there is no European central government of railways. Nothing. No minister of railways. No dictator. Not even a continental parliament. Not even a directing committee. Everything is done by contract. So we ask the believers in the state who pretend that we can never do without a central government were it only for regulating the traffic. We ask them, but how do European railways manage without them? How do they continue to convey millions of travelers and mountains of luggage across a continent? If companies owning railways have been able to agree, why should railway workers who would take possession of the railways not agree likewise? And if the Petersburg Warsaw Company and that of the Paris Belfort can act in harmony without giving themselves the luxury of a common commander, why, in the midst of our societies, consisting of free groups of workers, should we need a government? This has been oh, a production of Audible the end of the Anarchist. Chapter. You can find yeah. more Audible Anarchist yeah. on Very YouTube. Cool. All right, we'll just pause it for now. Cool. Do you have any thoughts on, on wrapping up this very short chapter before we uh, <laughs> decide what we want to do next? Yeah, um... Oh, sorry. Thoughts, thoughts on the chapter, or thoughts on uh, things to do next? Oh, both actually. We'll, we'll start with thoughts on the chapter, and we'll we'll move into what we should do next. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. So basically, I mean, obviously, he's just saying like, um, if if competing companies can can make these agreements uh, free of coercion from the state, then why shouldn't uh, ordinary workers who who already labor on these projects on these railways, um, mm-hmm. and of course, that can be applied through throughout um then uh what why shouldn't they be able to unite together to a common goal of um of just uh building up the quality of life of their community mm-hmm. essentially if if uh competing companies can do it then why can't laborers yeah does does that strike you as as is reasonable yeah yeah i think i think so um uh 
I don't know. I'm kind of. <laughs> I hear some hesitation. I'm kind of in this awkward, awkward puberty stage of of anarcho-communist, slightly leaning, uh, sure, <laughs> Marxist leaninist, but um, but I'm 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 not I'm not entirely sure. Um, like I would I would love to believe that, and I really want that to be the case. Um, but I'm not sure if there needs to be, again, like different stages as we as we go towards. Uh, again, a, a stateless, classless, moneyless society. If there needs to be different, uh, different sections that we go through before we get there, mm -hmm. or if, or if we can just set up these autonomous uh, communities that are able to operate for the good of their people without, without interference from any sort of hierarchical structure, um, a true, a true uh, communism, essentially. So, so you see a, a big need, or, or potentially a big role for the some sort of a state to come in and, and guide these, these different phases. Is that basically what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think potentially, potentially a dictatorship of the proletariat mm -hmm. um, to have some sort of um, guidance. Um, at, at least, at least in the, in the intermediary uh, stages. Yeah. Yeah. I can definitely see that as, as a distinct possibility. Um I think I think for me one of the deciding factors in in which way we we go on that I mean I mean from what little I know from what little theory I've read and and my own ideas I would say that the, one of the deciding factors is going to be one how educated are the are the general populace on on what we're going for if if it is to be sure. any sort of revolution and two how on board are they with with going in that direction Yeah that's a that's a really good point um and that that yeah that that's a very good point i think that class consciousness needs, needs to be uh maintained to to a large degree mm -hmm. um and that the proletariat needs to have that education because without that um without that sort of uh scientific socialism approach it's hard to see it's easy to see how people would just kind of uh quite possibly devolve um, yeah just revert back that that's how uh, Kropotkin keeps describing it as like, you know, you get caught up in new orders of, of, of doing business, new committees popping up, all the, all this, this sort of, of, of structure. Um, right. And it's, it's easy to just, yeah, kind of fall back into old habits and, and, you know, the most forceful voices rise to the, the, the fore, or at least the people with the, the biggest bark, I guess, so to speak. Um, and, and then, yeah, things just kind of go back and then, and then the, the populace at large is kind of like, oh yeah, this is going to be another one, another meaningless revolution It's going to be, you know, meet the old boss, same as the new boss or meet the new boss, same as the old boss, you know, that sort of thing the, the cycle continues basically. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, another piece of theory that I've read recently. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I forgot to mention this for sure. It's by this really, really cool popular dude. Um, he was big into the eighties. Um, I think it was called Animal Animal Farm. I think. Oh, just, sure. Just yeah. kidding. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you got me there. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah. So, so were you were you serious in 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 having recently read Animal Farm or? Um, I I have gone over Animal Farm, okay. but mostly to critique Animal Farm and sure. those who uh, just robotically refer back to that as the as the, the only possible. ultimate response to communism and why it won't work right. it didn't work with these anthropomorphized animals so <laughs> yeah it didn't work for the pigs they just you know, they couldn't tell them from the humans at the end so it's right, got to be the, the only the only possible end to that <laughs> <laughs> and of course we live in the same society with all the same technology and the same material conditions as in in revolutionary uh, USSR slash Russia, so of course it's going to go the same way. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> uh, but that brings up an, an an interesting thing that I think about a lot is, I mean, I certainly can't imagine any sort of re an actual revolution happening in in this country anyway, like in the in the the, the largest military. Mm. Uh, having country in the entire history of the world i i would i would i would um i would actually strongly disagree with that oh um, wonderful let's hear it not not from any point of like just 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 i i i don't, I don't yeah i think i think that a protracted people's uh revolution um 
or protected people's war rather um could could work out quite well um if if done correctly um i think that guerrilla war tactics are yeah in minecraft of course <laughs> we're, we're, this Love whole conversation minecraft. takes place in minecraft folks right 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 um <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that that has time and time again, like even in the Middle East, like, um, like we have recent examples of the U.S. war machine um, attempting to fight a generally, um, certainly not a equal, technically equal uh, military enemy, right? Like right. these are people with um, suboptimal weaponry and technology going up against all of the U.S.'s military funding and drafting and all of that, um, or not not necessarily drafting, but uh, tricking people into signing up to go die in some foreign war for uh, for college. Um, but you know, um, yeah. so like I, I I do think that uh, a again a protracted people's war could be in Minecraft a a mm -hmm. n not that it wouldn't be difficult, but I don't i don't buy the idea that like because the u.s has a huge military that they would be able to uh successfully deal with a properly done uh revolution in minecraft mm -hmm. well that's very interesting yeah you, you bring up some good points there you're right i mean look at how long we've been in afghanistan and we're just now saying that we're going to pull out on september 11th like yeah good good framing of that one there joe but, but anyway, um, yeah, those people had virtually nothing compared to the U.S. military, and yet they've kept them occupied for these 20 years now. It's coming up on 20 years. Um, right. So you're right. There, there, I... there is the potential for at, at least guerrilla tactics. Like there's, there's never going to be one nation's army or even the world's nation's armies against the U.S. That's, that's probably not going to go down well. But, but I, I, you do have a point with, with the idea of, a, a guerrilla style strategy having the potential to work in Minecraft. Right. In Minecraft. And there in are Minecraft. so many avenues that you can do go through in like a diversity of tactics. Um, mm -hmm. it, I mean, honestly, like, yeah, in Minecraft, I think, I think it could work. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it could work. Not that it wouldn't be, you know, bloody and not that. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, but I, I think it's, it's certainly possible. Um, yeah. And definitely, um, I would encourage you to not not be uh, subjugated into just being being afraid of that as as a concept. Mm -hmm. um, that would never work, and that would just end in like uh, the proletariat in Minecraft getting like needlessly slaughtered. Right. But um. But yeah, like e even again back to like the Middle East. Um. Mm -hmm. Like uh, one thing that they use fairly often, and uh, one thing is when <laughs> enacting a. Uh, a uh, Minecraft revolution <laughs> is to avoid <laughs> avoid patterns in terms of if if especially if you're a uh, guerrilla mm -hmm. uh, group. Um, but one thing that um, I've I've heard about a lot is the concept of like uh, basically you would just have you would have one individual or maybe a few, and they would put off a bunch of rounds nearby a military base. Um, and then they would they would make it so that it would seem like it was a greater force than it actually was, and then they would get the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. And then the the U.S. base would uh, in Minecraft mm -hmm. uh, respond with uh, basically a bombardment of of the area, and in so doing so, uh, it, bombardment of the empty area. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in doing so, you would waste their ammunition, and each given the amount of money that the U.S. pumps into their weaponry um you basically start to bleed the uh bleed the <laughs> the beast that's true that's true uh, that that's a very good point and um for for as much as as the the military budget is 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 seen as completely infinite or or at least potentially infinite there 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 has to be some point where it would start eating into other services i mean you, yes, you can print money for a long time, and as long as the U.S. has the, the most uh, trusted currency in the world, then it, it's probably, there's probably a long way you can go to w without totally um, dooming your country to, to rampant inflation. Uh, but still, there has to be some limits. I mean, even materially, there has to be some limits, too. Absolutely, um, yeah. 
Yeah, and and as as much as as that is the the strength of of the United States that it has such seemingly limitless resources and such a seemingly limitless limitless army, at the same time that that could be seen as uh, a sort of weakness because they are what what fuels that is is a constant was for one thing a constant stream of energy, so I mean it doesn't take right. that much to to disrupt. Uh, energy pipelines not that i would ever right. advocate for that sort of thing yeah but, but in minecraft yeah supply lines and it's and honestly it's it's not just about like in minecraft like uh face-to-face -face battles in fact like if you're operating as a guerrilla group you never want to face off with the enemy um for more than like a few yeah. minutes like you basically want to take off um just create some chaos and uh wound a few enemy enemy soldiers uh, right. in minecraft um and then get the hell out of there um but uh like you you never want to be entrenched um and even even like in in the u.s like the just the vastness of the continent or <laughs> basically on the sort of, that's true <laughs> the united states um that that would work I, I believe to the detriment of the u.s and the the fact that the u.s has to pour so much income into their military in order mm -hmm. to maintain uh essentially maintain capital uh and maintain the interests of the states the abroad um i think that speaks to a a serious inefficiency within our military um yeah but and and it, it, again uh sorry <laughs> i missed my point earlier uh, i distracted myself but um so it's 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 a uh you're you're not only in a war of attrition in Minecraft, you're not only uh, going just like bullet for bullet, but rather um, you're trying to win the will of the people and break the sure. morale, essentially. Sure. The, uh, yeah. So make I make them look foolish, make them look wasteful, make them look barbaric, whatever it is. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So there, there's lots of ways to get creative with Minecraft. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wondrous <laughs> game where you can do anything. Yeah. <laughs> procedural generation wow yeah that's oh, amazing how yeah. much that game like like literally though it's amazing how much that game has has stayed around and and still continues to be like my kids watch oh. minecraft videos and they play minecraft all the time it's 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 one of the two things that they do basically it's that and roblox but, <laughs> which also is just an infinite you know creative world right so but yeah yeah that's that's, that's a lot of interesting things to think about i i, I you know, I guess I never really thought about it in quite those terms, although I have thought a lot about how vulnerable um, just the United States and capitalism's uh, in capitalism's current form, the, their way of doing things where they get to these hyper efficiencies. Like we, we saw how little it takes during the pandemic for, you know, entire stores to be emptied of their shelves because they rely on on this this hyper efficient like you know as soon as something is, is purchased you order that for the next shipment and and you so you never have any sort of warehouse backup you, you just put the things right on the shelf and then they go right out the door and the next thing comes to replace just that one thing um yep. the, yeah the just in time strategy of doing things but, but we, we saw how just minor disruptions um and and i've even heard analysis that it wasn't so much because of people doing runs on things like toilet paper as much as it was just that they were switching from working in uh the office where they were supplied by by like uh, i think the company's georgia pacific one of the big ones that does like commercial toilet paper and commercial bathroom supplies to working at home where they were then purchasing stuff made for the retail sector and just that little bit of disruption th was what threw everything off so yeah exactly like there's there's so many uh points at which the system is woefully inefficient right and um the the supply lines and um the military industrial complex at large there's there's many points at which it can be uh hugely disrupted um in my craft <laughs> yeah yeah well and, and just thinking too about the the recent uh ice storm or blizzard or whatever it was in in texas and how mm -hmm. they just they just because they hadn't planned for that like they yep. i mean the republicans tried to make a bunch of hay about it being the turbines fault but right <laughs> none of the systems worked the, the entire system went down whether it was it was it was uh, petrochemically sourced 
whether it was new, I, I don't know if they have any nuclear plants in Texas actually, but whatever the source was, they all went down because none of them had been prepared properly. Oh, thank you very much for the uh, follow. What is what is your name? My Peeny Burn Mommy. <laughs> thanks, thanks so much for following. I hope you enjoy what you see. Uh, my name is Zach. If you if you're not familiar with me, if you're just tuning in, I I do uh, commentary usually with a guest um, about. We, we take a chapter a week of a leftist theory book and we kind of analyze it and try to, you know, relate it to the modern day and stuff like that. So I hope you like what you see and I hope you stick around. Uh, but anyway, getting back to um, what we were talking about, I guess I've lost my train of thought, actually. So if you if you had anything you wanted to add to what we were just talking about. I oh, know you're good. Um, yeah, I guess just the the inherent uh, inefficiencies within within the. Uh, within the systems that we that we have um even even on like a um uh just the power grid that power grids that we have in the u.s and of course the the issue within like what happened with texas was partially due i mean largely due to capitalism and also them de determining that they want to be uh free of um oversight from the state um right. but yeah yeah, they, they had to have their own special grid that, that didn't cross any state lines so they wouldn't have to have mm -hmm. federal regulations, regulations that would have forced them to winterize properly, ironically right. enough. <laughs> right. Yeah, and there, there was that. And then, there, yeah, like the, the um, systems of, um, of energy that they had that were going down. And then also just like the way that they everything was built as far as, yeah, not being winterized, like you mentioned. Yeah. Pretty, pretty wild stuff. Yeah, there, there's got to be some kind of a word for a system that looks like invincible, like it's it's so strong you can never imagine anything else. You take it for granted that it's always going to be there, like but in the, in reality, yeah. you just move one one gear, one piece of of the the equation, and the whole thing crumbles and falls apart. Right. I, yeah, I can't think of any word that kind of encaptures all of that. But if anyone yeah. out there knows one. The Death Star is kind of, I, I don't know. I, That's it, a I mean, really that, good analogy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was kind of like um, uh, the, the whole um, uh, original series, at least, um, by Lucas was done um, as a sort of a commentary on the, um, the Viet Cong being, or the, sorry, um, the, what's his, sorry, the South Vietnamese? Was that who the U.S.? That's who they backed, yeah. Okay, so the South Vietnamese, okay, uh, the North Vietnamese then, <laughs> mm -hmm. the communists that they're there to fight. Right, yeah, the um, Viet Cong, yes. Yeah, sorry, the Viet Cong. Um, mm -hmm. They they were essentially the the rebel forces, like they, they were represented by the rebel forces in the Star Wars trilogy. Isn't that oh. funny how so many Americans found so much uh, camaraderie and ideas with the the rebel forces? Just, oh yeah, and and just having come out of, I think I think the first Star Wars movies they came out in just what like maybe three or four years after the war finally wrapped up, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think it was like early mid '70s. Something yeah, like that. yeah. Huh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that that's a really good analogy. Something that that's yeah seems like there's got to be a way to make that into an adjective then, like <laughs> going full Death Star. <laughs> with your infrastructure there bro <laughs> yeah uh that's cool all right um so at this point uh i guess we got two options uh we can we can continue on with um just kind of talking about whatever and and you know we can bring up some maybe some unrelated things that are on your mind or we can uh get into the next chapter and uh probably not finish it 38 minutes is a long time for this this I mean, you know, when it when it add on the analysis, it's a long time for this stream, and, oh, and sure, yeah. um, so we may not get through all of it, but uh, you know, we can we can maybe break it into sections or something, and, and either you or, or or if you're not available next week, someone else can come and uh, sure. help me tackle that one. So, do you have a preference in that? Um, I I think um, if, as long as you're okay with either, um, I think I would probably prefer going more into freeform, um, just because. Uh, okay. I guess largely because just breaking up into different parts uh, might be awkward for, especially if it's another another guest that that comes in and in the midst of uh, the chapter next time. Uh, but awesome, I, I can respect that sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. Nice. 
Um, so anything, you know, before I ask you any more uh, specific questions, is there anything in general that, that's kind of been on your mind that, that you'd like to talk about? Yeah. Just, just really anything. I, what's, what's on your mind? Cool. Um, so I guess uh, one thing that I've been uh, thinking about lately is um, the idea of, like, apathy, okay. especially within especially within the ranks of those who would consider themselves uh, various forms of, of leftist or, or even, even a uh, communist, um, Marxist, mm-hmm. Leninist, anarcho-communist, uh, whatever, um, whatever yeah. is, uh, yeah, the, the idea of apathy and the fact that like, um, most of us, at least, especially in the, in the United States, um, need to, um, <laughs> work more towards, uh, organizing and actually acting on our principles Mm -hmm. um rather than just like because i I think it's um it's one thing to be like woefully unaware of the material conditions that we exist within the the fact that like a better world is possible right um it's quite another thing to see the fact that like that these systems must be changed and then proceed to do essentially nothing apart from like engage in online memory um just like harding <laughs> random uh funny memes that come up uh, that make you feel intellectually superior to to um to other uh potential me- members of the yeah. of the of the struggle that just aren't aren't aware and aren't as as well educated as you because like even even a few years ago like i i was um <laughs> i was not in, uh raging against the machine quite as well as I, I could have because and i wasn't even aware of like i wasn't even aware that communism was a thing apart from like uh the whole idea of like communism bad i, I did come across the communist manifesto at a relatively relatively young age but that was more out of the morbid curiosity after i was informed that marx was a uh the devil incarnate but um but yeah i think um i think it's important that we uh, engage on our principles and um yeah. but yeah sorry that <laughs> that was a long spiel but um no no i definitely appreciate that a lot i think that's that's definitely really important it's kind of like what uh what uh ben burgess's new book is titled uh something like canceling comedians while the world burns and and i think i think that really encapsulates kind of what you're talking about like yeah, you can spend you can spend a whole lot of energy and a whole lot of time just getting into personal dramas online, uh, doing the like you know I'm I'm you know woker than thou sort of thing. And what really do you accomplish at the end of the day, other than maybe maybe a, maybe a brief sense of self satisfaction? But right. you're not changing material conditions, that's for sure. Um, so. If you had a piece of advice for for someone who's who's starting out and, and maybe you know uh, is in a similar position to you or I, where you have a little bit of theory under your belt, you kind of have you at least know the basics of it. You know um, why the 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 capitalist framework of employer uh, or or should say owner of means of production versus the the worker who makes those means of production profitable. Why that's that's uh, I don't want to say untenable because definitely it could probably go on for a lot longer, but definitely undesirable at least if if you care at all about uh, human freedom, if you care at all about democracy, what would be your advice then to someone who's, who's maybe at that point where they, they, they feel like they want to get involved. um, But they want, they want, yeah, they want to do like what you say. They want to take their, their activism offline. Where, where would you, where would you say that they should turn next, at least as a, as a point to putting out feelers towards something? Um, I would say uh, this this is gonna kind of be just a stream of consciousness, so not necessarily. Go for it! I love those. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess one thing would be to um, to ensure that you are able to um, look into theory and um, and analyze it, but also make sure that that's that's still not your main um, your main uh, means of of uh engaging because i i would say that that that's not even living your life as a as a communist um <laughs> um I, I would say that 
essentially you need to be putting in about 5% of, of learning theory and, and about 95% of um, just uh, looking into how you can engage your community, even if it's not necessarily with uh, like pure left um, uh, organizations, like even if it's a sort of nonprofit that helps out uh, refugees in your area or, or whether, wherever you are, um, if if it, if you live in an urbanized area, then there's likely to be several of those. Um, I, I know in, in Richmond there are quite a few. Um, even if it's like with the local church or organization or whatever, um, just engage with those. Uh, be open about your viewpoints. Um, live your life in a principled way. Um, let it be known as far as um, as far as you can do so safely. Um, right. Your your viewpoints um, and uh, yeah, uh, look look to organize locally. If if there are any leftist organizations, obviously do that. Um, and uh, propagandizing <laughs> is a is a good thing. Um, and um, the like online spaces can be used as as a means for that. Um, but I think it's important to do more than that, and to again not rest on the the whole like knowing that you know something that other people don't, and just. Right. Uh, engaging with memes and being a, a funny guy in your in your group and just sharing memes in like already leftist spaces uh, where everyone's going to agree with you anyway, more or less. I mean, obviously it's left spaces, so <laughs> that is often not the case. But um, I think like one thing to 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 reckon with and and like realize is the fact that like in order for a a people's proletariat to like a, a um, class consciousness to be achieved in order for international work workers of the world to unite mm -hmm. in order for a true uh, communism to, to occur or at least begin to go through those stages at, at a large scale. Um, we need to realize that like any one of us could like die <laughs> at yeah. any point, uh, whether by the hands of the state, by like just walking outside and getting hit by a car or um, and, and, and in addition to that, like we need to recognize that um, all the places that we've come from, like I know that I've come from a very weird path to get to where I'm at right now, mm -hmm. ideologically um, and politically, um, like we could easily later on stray from that path. Um, sure. So if what we're doing right now, we know what we're doing to be like good and correct um, mm -hmm. and for the good of the people, we need to ensure that we are not um, that we are not inexpendable that we are in fact very expendable and that during this time like right now that we are bringing as many uh as many fellow people to to the cause as possible so that mm -hmm. when we get dissuaded when we make a little money and become apathetic pieces of shit that we um or you know get killed or whatever <laughs> um that our our loss is not so significant as to do any actual damage to the movement um Mm -hmm. but but yeah um oh uh, additionally like that that's another fear of mine is that the the this new new leftism in uh, i'm sorry just look at chat uh, yeah uh, sorry uh so this 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 new rise of of uh leftism uh, even like what someone could consider like radical leftism in the united states that this will all like become fucking nothing as soon as some sorts of um, capitulation is made to to unions as soon as the living wage goes up at a somewhat significant rate um, as as soon as like we get health care for all mm -hmm. that the people that give a shit right now won't give a shit so I guess I guess uh, just look beyond your own your own self-interest mm -hmm. interest of your country um, especially like this particular country because um, <laughs> um, yeah yeah um, but yeah, I guess um, I guess that that's like um, that that's part of the reason why I moved away from um, a lot of anarcho syndicalism is because mm -hmm. um, a lot of it centers around um, and this isn't necessarily true of like every card carrying member of the IWW or anything, but like a lot of it centers around um, the interests of American workers and not not necessarily the workers of the world. Um, which is what we need to we need to focus on the international proletariat. We can't just be focused within our own borders, uh, because these these um, and that's another thing. Like as American communists, um, or sorry, speaking for myself, as an American communist, um, 
the the nation that we exist in mm-hmm. is like a nation that largely benefits from capitalism. Even even the exploited workers still to an extent benefits from being in America and the the way in which the United States ravages these other countries which are like uh at the <clears throat> those, those that um are are ravaged for resources or what have you and are in such poor states of condition because because of the way that colonization has played out and the way that it continues to go um any of these these people will continue to 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 fight for for what what is needed mm-hmm. um such as like the the um farmer the farmers protest and uprising in in india um which was like massive um and is still insofar as we're ongoing um like and that's 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 in much poorer conditions that that we um that we currently exist in as americans um uh for the most part obviously um it's a general generalization but by and large like your average uh laborer in india is going to have a worse time than a laborer in the united states um additionally um like a friend of mine mentioned like even like even those that are like destitute and homeless in the United States, you still probably have more resources than those within a lot of those within a lot of those those countries within the global south. Like, um, sure. so there's really there's very little excuses as far as like why we aren't able to to put together um, uh, direct aid within our within our communities. And again just uh live a principled life and uh be be a nice approachable person to the community um so as to be open about communism and be able to uh be able to be uh someone that when someone comes upon the fact that you're a communist it's not just like oh well well you know fuck you then it's uh people then wanting to know more because of that uh, so that basically you're you're a respectable banner for 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 your cause. Um, but anyway, yeah, that, that again, <laughs> very long spill. But uh, yeah, no, no, a, that, that, there's there's a lot of, of really great stuff in there. Uh, keeping an eye to an international uh, sort of of solidarity. I think that's really important, um, especially when when the right is is at this point so keen on on kicking the immigrant at every every turn. Um, you know, dispelling the myths about the way things are happening in other countries, uh, trying to build international solidarity. Although, that, I mean, for myself, that sounds like a really huge task. Like, I wouldn't even know where to begin uh, reaching out to, to people from other countries. You know, I'm, I'm just I'm doing my best even to reach out to people within my own at this point. Um, but yeah, I, I really agree with the, um, spending as much time as you can on, on building those uh, the sorts of relationships within your community, building building the movement, like like and and putting a smattering of theory into it. I think that's a healthy way to, to look at it. That's that's really good. Um, it seems like Virginia uh, has has really changed in the last few years. At least at least if you're going by uh, national electoral map. Um, okay, in in terms of turning more like deeper purple or yeah, like it, it's moving even. You know, even though it's towards liberalism and not true leftism yet, at least it's in a leftward direction. It, it seems. Would Would you say that's been your experience? Yeah, yeah, I'd say that's largely accurate. I think uh, one thing about that is that, like, um, I I personally see electoral politics more as a a tool rather than like an overall goal, because of course, like, of course, the masters of capital aren't going to let things change via via yeah. the voting booth but um yeah but ultimately yeah i think um i think that's that's fairly accurate um like i i worked on a couple of political campaigns in in virginia including one against a um a rather renowned um uh tea party member um who was a member of congress for the seventh district of virginia uh dave brock excuse me um I ran with, uh, or I didn't run, with, but I, I worked on um, as an employee for um, Abigail Spanberger's campaign, um, and okay. we were able to to take him out, which was awesome. Awesome, uh, good job. Guy, 
Um, as much as I detest uh, Ella Glassmanberger as well, I just detest, detest her a little bit less. Than, uh, uh, it's still got to be a good feeling to work towards something that you actually see, you know, bear fruit, even if it's very small and, and not quite adequate fruit yet. Oh, right, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was nice. It was nice. Um, then she, there was like a leaked call, actually, from the particular politician, Abigail Spamberger, where she essentially uh, said something to the extent of, um, we need to stop talking about socialism. Socialism is poison. It's ruining our uh, voter turnout. Ugh. And that, uh, like, basically she went on to, ruining to blame voter people turnout. for, very, right, 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 yeah. She went on to, like, blame uh, people promoting socialism for the fact that she struggled in her most recent um, run, uh, I believe, last last uh fall but yeah yes. um Some, something anyway. tells me she got a little bit like 180 degrees backward maybe maybe it's oh, yeah. her that that needs to adopt <laughs> some more socially uh popular programs because pretty much every you know at least from the government side every every program that gets uh, branded as as socialism whether it's housing or or food stamps or um you know uh nationalized health care or, or single payer health care that is um oh shoot was, where was i going with that um, oh just i guess that those are wildly popular. Oh, wildly popular yeah yeah thank yeah. you thank you yeah you knew exactly where i was going yeah they, you know they pull time and time again like like more than half of the people are all for it um even people that wouldn't necessarily benefit directly from it everybody knows somebody who who could use more help with one thing or another um right. And, I, and, you know, I would say if you're thinking about your, your strategy, whether you're going to put your time into electoralism, whether you're going to put it into building these sorts of parallel organizations um, to uh, one day oppose the, the capitalist hegemony, I, I think looking at, at the, the sort of thing, I think it's important to, as you say, uh, look at what is possible with electoralism and, and kind of narrow in on the things that would help you know, it should be one system helping the other. So, so as much as possible, electoralism should bring us things like like healthcare and and um, other sorts of social programs, so that we're not just having uh, most people barely, you know, scraping by, having to work two or three jobs, not able to organize at work, not able to even, you know, talk about unionizing because they're sure. they're so run down by their job. So I think I think that's that's a you know and just from my perspective that would be a, a pragmatic way of going about things like boost right. where you can towards those social programs and then otherwise kind of focus your energy on building what comes next with the resources yeah, you have. Yeah, and I think I think like uh, it's it's really easy to get bogged down into electoral politics, especially because this this nation like fetishizes it. Sorry, uh, fetishizes it. Mm -hmm. Uh, to such a extreme degree, like, oh, as for if, sure. As if, as if going to the voting booth is like really, really meaningful. Uh, oh, when ultimately, yeah. it's it's not so much. Um, like a single food drive would be more beneficial to your neighbor yeah. than than you going out and voting for whoever the DNC told you to vote for. Um, mm -hmm. And and I think time and time again, we're shown that like these incremental changes are not enough. Um, that they they won't even throw us their their scraps, um, and yeah. So ultimately, ultimately though, I I do think that that uh, electoral politics should be used as a tool <laughs> to overthrow the state, essentially in Minecraft. Um, but um, but that it also like it can't be your primary thing. Like it should be a secondary yeah. or even or even further back. Uh, yeah. Tool. As, especially if you're someone who's coming from the United States, where things are so stacked against any sort of uh, competing voice to the dominant two systems. And even within their own parties, things are stacked against any new ideas kind of right. breaking the surface and coming into the mainstream. I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure we all know uh, or, or I'll remember what happened to Bernie both times when <laughs> yeah. when he dared yeah, to I, I, question I, I, any yeah. of the orthodoxy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and like that's that's the thing too is that like we we don't have the time to rely on incremental change. Right. That's that's um, another very important point, especially when talking about things like climate change, which is already upon us. Yeah, and incremental change is like the best scenario that we can hope for, essentially, yeah. in a system such as our own. Oh, especially yeah. with with all the money that sloshes around 
which I, I, I was just reading um, the, the theory book that I've been reading in my own time has been uh, Democracy at Work by Richard Wolff, which is a really good read. Like he's a okay. really good communicator about these these very complex ideas. He's he's like uh, the, the Carl Sagan, basically, of, of leftist thought. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I enjoy Richard Wolff's works quite a bit. Um, I haven't actually read a lot of his stuff, but I've listened to a good many of his lectures. Yeah, um, yeah. This this has been my first book of his, but but um, uh, oh, where oh, shoot, I keep losing my train of thought. Um, oh, I'm sure I'll get back to it. But anyway, it, it's been a great book. Uh, he really he really. Uh, oh, I think I think I was going uh, towards structuralism. How, th- how things are so structured against any sort of change. Um, oh, that's the money. That that's where I was going. That that's what I was going to say. Um. With so much money sloshing around, basically, as, as Richard Wolff describes it, that is uh, capitalism influencing uh, the way that, that the government relates back to it. So, so the more money in the system, the more you know, uh, favors are going to be won for uh, the worker uh, and owner uh, version of doing things. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and with our system, especially since Citizens United, the doors have just been flown open. There, there's, there's no amount of money that's too much, as, as long as you know the right ways to funnel it. Um, <laughs> and, and people will say, well, you know, that's, ne- that's never a guarantee. And they can point you know, to one or two times where the person who spent the most didn't end up winning. But again, imagine the alternative. Imagine that, that, that things were reversed. Um, it's, it's much more likely that that uh i don't know where i was going with that but anyway um taking taking the money out of the equation would would go a long way to to helping the average worker actually have a voice and and, and a real input in their in electoralism but because there's just so much of it the capitalist wins again and right. time and yeah, time I... again virtually buy out the the people that that make all the major decisions about their own business yeah. And about labor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't I don't think that we're ever going to have like a true form of democracy until <laughs> until we have a classless, mindless, dateless society in which everyone has an equal an equal voice and um and yeah, and money isn't such a thing um that can that can make those sorts of influences. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good way of framing it too. I think that that's that's what Wolf does in the, in the last few chapters of, of democracy at work is he, he talks about just branding it in a very simple way as, as, as democracy at work. You, you, you love democracy. It, it constantly pulls off the charts, even in America, everyone loves democracy. Everyone loves the idea of everyone having an equal say and, and all that stuff. Why do we accept that in our political life, but, but are completely fine with autocracy in the workplace? And I think just that that little switch in a lot of people's minds it can really get them at least rolling in the right direction to start questioning some of the things that they've taken for granted, that there has to be workers and owners. There has to be right. people that, that, that make out like kings and, and, and people that uh, just get tossed table scraps. Um, yeah. I think those little things are very important, though. Like, uh, even if you were to, to go to a minimum wage worker and say, like, uh, say like at a fast food place and say, you know, why don't you count out? Just like keep a, keep a, a mental track of, of how much product you move in, in your shift and then compare <laughs> that to how much you're, you're compensated. I mean, sure. You can say, yeah. well, some of that's got to go to advertising. Some of that's got to go to, or got to go to the boss. Some of it's going to go to the boss and the managers and, and, and the other employees and stuff who don't run the register. But even then, you know, calculate things out, see how much more you are producing in, in terms of, of gross revenue than you're actually taking home. And just, th- just little things like that, I think can really make a big difference in, um, it's kind of like what we were talking about before, how capitalism appears to be so inevitable and invincible, but really right. all you got to do is you got to just poke at the right place and it, it just kind of deflates as it's a yeah. mirage almost. Yeah, exactly. I mean, before this, we had the divine right and kings and, that fell and hopefully sooner rather than later. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully sooner rather than later. Well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cause I mean, if it doesn't, they're, you know, Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos and, and Bill Gates, they're just going to keep running us off that cliff and, and they'll be laughing all and the way down. And... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they'll go off to Mars <laughs> the last second. Oh boy. 
<laughs> yeah. I, I don't think I'd be too sad if Elon Musk went off to Mars, actually. But I would be okay with that as well. I, yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd be fine with yeah. that. I don't. I don't think I would miss his witty repartee on the Joe Rogan podcast or anything like that. Right. <laughs> or his yeah, we we who we want. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. He, oh yeah, that's right. He did say ooh. Uh. That and uh, I mean, I could. I would sh- I could shit on Elon Musk for a bit. Please, um, please do. That, that time he went after that uh, that soccer coach, who like was trying to, or I don't know if he was necessarily a soccer to- coach, but it was he was um, part of the rescue team that went in to save that that um, I, I forgot what it was. It like Bangladesh uh, group of of uh, like it was like children Bangladesh and they'd been or... exploring caves. Is that what you're talking uh-huh. about? Yeah. yeah, and um, and one of the members of the rescue team was like, "Yeah, this this submarine that Elon Musk is trying to design to go in t- and uh, and re- perform this rescue quite publicly, oh, is like right. is bullshit. It's not going to work. It doesn't keep in mind like oh. the structure of the cave and the formations coming up out of the water and all this." And then Elon Musk got pissed and called the dude um, a a uh, child abuser um a pedophile over like online like publicly on twitter oh i don't remember Public going basis. that far <laughs> holy <laughs> shit wow yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. elon musk is uh is a very uh he's the most fragile wild. individual <laughs> and i see yeah. this i i i see this time and time again with these these really rich uh egoistic sort of dudes who who have convinced even themselves that they've they're just the, the 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 unappreciated geniuses. No matter how much money and praise is lavished on them, it, it can never be yeah. enough. And no matter how much of their <laughs> how much of their uh, inventions are e- extrapolated from public domain, things that they, they took oh, and copied yes. and, and that they yeah rely on their working force to perform. That's but anyway, right. yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no, no. That, I definitely appreciate that. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, and 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 that's. That's one of the things that, that Kropotkin drives home again and again is that all the knowledge in your head, all the all the infrastructure, all the 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 things that sustain your life and, and make it good are the work of not just everyone you see around you, but everyone that has been generation after generation building up little by little. And so right. to, 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 to try and demarcate this one little part of it because you happen to figure out, a, a, you know, a hyperloop that that would be incredibly <laughs> inefficient if you actually got down to how many people it could move per hour versus say right. a bullet train which which is yeah. already technology that we can do without you know all this this futuristic uh complicated stuff but, yeah. but to demarcate that it's 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 ridiculous because yeah maybe that little bit was was your own contribution but it's on the backs of like 99.9% of, of what went into that happened before you even showed up on the earth. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck Musk. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, no honestly, um, like that sort of thing, um, like capitalism brings such a reversal and, um, and at least a, uh, it slows down technology and industry to a Absolutely. huge event. Like the, the idea that capitalism breeds innovation is, utter horseshit yeah um but yeah but that that's that's again it's it's these myths you just poke on it just a little bit and it completely deflates uh, if if the patents of of the world were just thrown wide open there would be so much innovation because now instead of having to to reinvent these things that that someone else has invented uh but has put behind a paywall you can just build on what they've done I mean, there would be there would be a flowering of human innovation. We would solve almost certainly many of these major problems that face us these days, and in, in things yeah. like energy and transportation and you know food distribution. I'm sure there's there's limitless things that we could do if yeah. knowledge was available to the the people that should be its rightful heirs, which is everybody. Exactly, and even like going even further than that, like. Um, the the fact that most workers right now, you know, capitalism is built such that uh, the the labor force goes into work and they put in their eight hours, and then they go home and they go the fuck to sleep, and then they go back and they toil again and they make you know as little bit of a wage as they can, uh, their masters their their owners of of capital can get away with 
giving, like giving them, them to sustain um, them. Yeah. Like if, if they were if they were free to labor and, and fully uh, benefit from the fruits of their labor, then they would be free to explore other things that interested them. And like and if like Nikolai Tesla, for example, is an mm-hmm. excellent example of a scientist who worked toward the betterment of humanity, not for, you know, uh, just lining his pockets, but for mm-hmm. for the greater good. Yeah, for and sure. Then, you know, the one that we uh, build up as a fucking hero in the United States is, of course, you know, Thomas Edison, who screwed over Edison and a number of other scientists. And because because of the acts of Edison alone, like mm-hmm. th- there's there's so much technology lost. Um, yeah. And like we we would be significantly ahead uh, technologically as 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 a humanity if if it weren't for the acts of this single piece of shit known as Edison, who again we we put up as like, oh, he's so fucking smart. Look yeah. at him; he made the light bulb in the United States. Like that's what we learn about him in school, not the fact that he like kidnapped local <laughs> pets and tortured them for like experiments mm. and again stole the labor mm-hmm. of other other innovators and then just slapped on the copyright and made a buttload of money off of it. Yeah, but well... that that's what capitalism breeds, though it doesn't. It doesn't further humanity. It, it stunts it and uh, forces it into uh, <laughs> very poor. Uh, it's artificial poverty. scarcity, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it's it's hoarding of resources, and it, you know, I, I I say this a lot on the stream, but I think that's the way that we should frame all of this stuff. This this idea that that wealth. And what in whatever form it is, whether whether it's it's uh, just owning means of production, whether it's it's literally having dollars, whether it's uh, just having a lot of patents that you can you know slap anyone around with that you feel like, that's all just really hoarding, and and it it should be something that is 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 socially shunned, as as you know not just a benign thing. Oh, you know it doesn't matter if the rich person does whatever they feel like with their money well, it actually does matter what they do with their money it, it literally does hurt the poor because the ho- the poor get uh put into housing that's in environmentally unsafe areas or or um they they get put into working conditions that are unsafe like like the decisions of the rich no matter how you slice it they, they do have consequences and so we shouldn't be just giving them a pass we should instead be talking about them as though they're hoarding i think Great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, capitalism is a a woefully inefficient system uh, yeah. because it's there not to benefit humanity, but but again, to Just benefit the few. Uh, the few. Yeah. yeah, absolutely true. Absolutely true. And 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 we're all poorer for it because of of the people that can't even spend time to to uh, develop what other otherwise me may, may be the next brilliant invention of one kind or another because they're stuck working at Burger King or, or, you know, they have to take care of a, a sick parent and, and they just don't have any time or, or money left to pursue any sort of passion. You know, I'm sure we've lost countless Einsteins and Edisons. And, and you know, one more thing about Edison, I, I don't know if you're familiar with his, his whole story, but he ended up as a demonstration electrocuting a circus elephant to death. Yes, yeah, that's that's one of the many animals they did that with. Like he would steal, he would steal local like pets around the neighborhood. Like he was and a monster. <laughs> electrocute them to death in little tests, and then he would blame rival scientists on it. He was a piece of shit. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Yes, a and monster. you see, you yeah. see this time and time again when you actually dig into these people's backstories. That's one of those those myths that props up capitalism again. That that turns out to just be a bunch of puffery if you poke on it a little bit. Elon Musk yep. is not some wonderkin boy genius who who yeah. invented, you know, the the future for us all, and we should be so happy to to, you know, uh, uh, sniff his his vape pen as he jets off to Mars. <laughs> uh, in fact, his family had a di- uh, an emerald mind, and it was apartheid yeah. emeralds. So they they yep. benefited from apartheid. They benefited from from. Uh, oppressing not just the poor, but a certain uh, uh, race of the poor to make their wealth. Mm. And from that, he was able to just do whatever the hell he felt like. And so, you know, and then, and and now that he's at his point where he has uh, a a reputation and a name built for himself and people want to come work for him, he can just skim off of their inventions. 
Right. Yeah, metocracy is such a fucking lie. Uh, it's a joke. And a very important thing to like realize, um, and that helps with bringing people over into being like you know radicalized. Um, like, uh, wasn't it uh, Herman Noville or something who said something along the lines of like the United States is a country full of of uh, poor people who believe that they're uh, oh, just yeah. a few steps away from becoming a millionaire or something along those lines. Yeah, but, the, um, the temporary embarrassed millionaire. Oh right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good yeah. turn of phrase. Like even even when I was like uh like I've I've I'm I sculpt and I do game development and stuff and I've always been like pretty <laughs> not to like build myself up or anything, but I've been, you know, pretty good at it, um, even from a young age. And well, you uh, can see from the picture that I have up on screen right now, you you're definitely pretty damn good at what you do. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. That sculpt is actually by another person. Oh, is it? Uh, okay. Well, I, I worked with him and I worked with the concept artist. Very the cool. painting is by Anyway, uh, sorry, I don't need to. No problem. No to, problem. To interrupt that. Um, but yeah, like, so I've been told that, like, um, basically that because of my skills and because of how good I am at what I'm doing, that I will become renowned for it, <laughs> yeah. and that I will uh, be able to generate some sort of wealth from it uh, to a large degree because, like, because if you're good at something, mm-hmm. then you should be rewarded for that thing in an appropriate, you know, a. a uh, the amount that you're good at something equals the amount that the amount that you input gets me oh, sorry <laughs> the other way around the amount of output and the quality of that output right. determines the amount of input and the quality of that input as far right. as outgoing labor versus incoming right right metabolism. Right. um but yeah but i mean you know i'm i'm in my late 20s i'm learning a new mm-hmm. software <laughs> in order to generate enough wealth to like you know, survive and hopefully uh, at one point later on be able to do what I am good at doing like full time and everything. But like, but that, that whole thing that I was told as a kid by like well-meaning people um, was, you know, bullshit. Um, like, yeah, sorry. That, <laughs> that was all to say that like mitocracy is bullshit. <laughs> oh uh, yeah. Couldn't agree more. Like, like, and, and and that's always the 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 liberals' solution to everything is is well, you know, if we have a, all we got to do is is level the playing field, and then the cream will rise to the top naturally, and all this stuff will will happen. And and you know, of course, many of those people are like uh, your Elizabeth Warren type, where they <laughs> they've had a lot of privilege that they don't necessarily know or or, or recognize, and uh, so they assume that. That with just a bit of tweaking, with just a bit of arranging, putting the right person in place uh, to, at, at the helm of things, that we can get to the point where everyone can re- rise to the top. Well, I mean, if you think two seconds about the way capitalism is structured, even if everyone started at the same level and, and, and had exactly the same opportunities, went to all the, the, as the same quality of education... Um, had the same amount of, of health care, even if we, we solved all of those things uh, to the point where everyone could be a, a doctor or a lawyer or, or some other sort of, you know, uh, high priced sort of career. Sure. There's only so many slots to, to stick those people in. It, it is structurally a pyramid. Right. And it, it right. can't it can't be otherwise. There has to be support people to uh, do the work. You know? Right. And I mean, hey, we have the prison systems. Um, <laughs> <There's always laughs> that's where that. the majority of uh, U.S. based production is is uh, <sighs> taken from is by prisoners who are paid like pennies on the dollar, essentially uh, way, way less than minimum wage, essentially yeah. forced labor, uh, both for like like putting out wildfires and making our license plates. And base- most most any product that's made in the United States, the majority of it is produced via uh, prison population. Um, but you know, which, which I mean, I mean, really puts it into question whether or not we are even a capitalist state at this point, whether we're not just working on a, a mostly slave economy. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, quite literally. Uh, I mean, that 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 was the one big loophole of of oh, 14th Amendment. I want to say the the one yeah, that, that abolished uh, 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 slavery as as a, as supposedly as a, as a form of of economy. Unless you've been sent to prison. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the land of the free, though. 
<laughs> right. And I think like, um, yeah, I, I think a lot of uh, people within the United States have been propagandized and brainwashed to the extent uh, where they value value the idea of labor uh, and fetishize that and um, the idea of meritocracy and everything to the point where like I <laughs> someone quite close to me um, I I brought up the fact that like that this you know this is where our production comes from in the United States things that are made in the United States the mo majority of it is coming from uh, vastly underpaid prison population who are oftentimes coerced into those positions <laughs> like I mean massively mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that they're you know in prison for one um and their response to that their response to that was well at least they're able to do work and they're not just sitting around wasting their time like that was their response not oh wow that's fucked up we shouldn't do that to fellow human beings it was oh yeah. well at least they're doing something like <laughs> oh man that that's really sad yeah, yeah. wouldn't yeah. want to think too hard you might might start feeling bad for someone <laughs> exactly and you might actually start wanting to advocate for their rights yeah so yeah. i think i think that is one baseline requirement for for a person to be able to be radicalized is at least at least a crumb of empathy <laughs> i would i would absolutely agree with that yeah it's yeah. it's very hard to i mean you can throw all the facts and, and logic and and statistics about anything climate change labor relations anything like that but if someone doesn't really care to begin with um and and they don't really care to even try and put themselves in in other people's shoes, then it's not really going to do any good. They'll they, they'll just take the easy way out. They'll find someone who says no, you're wrong, and they'll say, oh, this guy says you're wrong, and, and I'm just going to believe him because it's easier, and I can just go about my day and not have to worry about it. Right, right. You're Tucker Carlson's and Benny Shadibo types. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. That's that's the thing they always tend to miss, though, is is that. True, facts don't care about your feelings, but your feelings aren't always changed by facts either. I mean, even if you intellectually change your mind about something, you're still probably going to feel some way about it. And right. people not wanting to have that cognitive dissonance are going to grasp for things that explain it so that they don't have to think differently. You know, they'll, oh, it's, it's, it can, you know, global warming, it, it must be just a conspiracy to, to, fund more global warming research it's more climate science it's a, it's grand conspiracy of the scientists who are pushing all this stuff it, it can't it can't be that they're right it can't right. be that the people that that go on on tucker carlson and others and and, and just so doubt so that people say whoa, whoa wait maybe it's not let's just wait you know it can't <laughs> be that, that those people are the ones who are really uh having the, the the biggest influence and and Where, not that? trusting the science and not going with the science and the way things actually are right wasn't it it was it was ben shapiro shapiro who said um um not not to not to uh, get too distracted by all the chicanery from uh from right-wing pundits no it's okay um, it can be a lot of fun <laughs> <laughs> they're fun to shit on them that's uh, that's true <laughs> But, you know, like, um, it was it was Ben Shabibo who said um, something along the lines of, like, well, you know, if if global sea levels rise, then uh, then, of course, you know, there is there's going to be a rising value of, of oh, uh, real estate because no, there's going no. to be more beachfront. Like I, I, and he said, like, non ironically, too, like in a debate that he like staged versus like a, you know, ill informed uh, college kid yeah. who was just like there with the with the question and dealing with all that nervousness and awkwardness. And then Ben Shapiro coming up with his with his big brain explanations, and and that's what he came out with. Yeah, it's just like oh, you know, we're gonna have more, we're gonna have more real estate on the beach. Well, not, it's gonna be great. Yeah, not only that, I, I remember he also said, uh, you know, oh, if sea level rises, people will just sell their their beachfront property. Oh, right, that's right. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then of course there's the classic that's underwater. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there's that classic H bomber line of like, who are you gonna sell it to? Fucking Aquaman. <laughs> <laughs> that is perfect it's perfect like yeah all these these facts and logic and yet somehow that was your solution that you came up with amazing right. <laughs> <laughs> all right well it, it is getting close to the the two hour mark and that's that's usually around the time that, that i like to to keep these things too just to kind of sure you know um so maybe we can get into more of your your work and your personal life doing these uh the the model 
work that you do. Maybe you could uh, say a little bit about that and I'll, I'll bring that up on screen too. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So um, again, my name is uh, Jared Anderson. Um, I'm a game developer uh, and uh, I, I work in uh, tabletop games um, and through my, my company and by my company, I, I generally be, mean myself and a few, a few artists that I, um, I do contract work with um, and sort of do creative directing with. Um, but I, I produce a line of figures through Garage Studios um, and uh, I'm, I'm working on a, a, a sort of tabletop skirmish game, if anyone's aware of what that means. Uh, it's similar to a Warhammer 40k or um, that, that sort of thing, D&D, uh, kind of in that same sort of genre. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I produce a line of um, figures for that. Um, and then I've got uh, Seize, the Main, Seize the Minis of uh, Protein. Protein. I love that name. Which is thank you, yeah, thanks. I was I was quite happy when I came up with it, <laughs> but uh, yeah, where I just kind of post uh, different different things I've been working on, whether they're personal pieces or commissions, uh, which I am open on on commissions as well. Uh, feel free to com- uh, communicate with me there if if you're interested in That's really checking cool. that out. But uh, but yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, and Dara Studios is kind of my main my main deal. Oh, sure. um, put that up right now. And. Uh, but oh, you're good. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so I've I've been doing stuff with with that sort of thing for about, um, I guess probably when I was about fourteen is when I started sculpting uh, and getting into game development, and then um, you know to in like baby steps sort of ways. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, but more recently I've been wanting to uh, put forth. Uh, games um, and figures from something of a uh, something of a uh, far left uh, commentary. Oh, um, that's very cool. Things. Um, thank you. Yeah, whether whether through like actual figures from like a uh, uh, figures historical figures from like Val Blair Mountain or something along those lines, or or just a general like uh, commentary through symbolism um, and like expression and fantasy and things of that nature um so as to uh <laughs> uh normalize that more so um yeah, to the awesome. to the general populace and uh you know spread my propaganda through fun and games yeah well i mean fun and games and communism. you know I, a lot a lot of gamers of, of of any stripe would like to believe that that these sorts of games don't have any politics in them inherently and anytime you inject uh you know an elf who who's who's black or you know a character who's trans or or any of these other things that oh well th- then then that becomes political there's there's you know cis straight white man in games and then there's there's political races right right so, but, but uh orcs which were basically invented by talking being based off of according to Tolkien non-european mongoloids that that's uh, not that's not political that's no <laughs> no that's totally devoid of politics what are you talking right. about yeah. <laughs> yeah. no that, that's that's clearly not true you, you can't get away from politics even even supposed neutrality carries with it the the inherent you know endorsement of the status quo so right and even that's a political quo, statement that's decades old and yeah yeah so, yeah so why not why not try and push things in, in more of a leftward direction i'm sure there'd be a huge market for it out there plenty of plenty of leftists who you know like to study things and like to have a rich fantasy life and and i'm sure would love that sort of thing so that's that's awesome to hear that how did you uh first get into these sort of sculptures um <laughs> uh let's see um trying to figure out a backstory it's not going to take more than like 10 minutes um, no, no, no. you know uh, we, you know i we're, we're just wrapping up but you can you can take your time don't don't worry about how long it takes just okay yeah, cool go cool, for cool. it um all right nice um so when i <laughs> growing up uh i started getting interested in like dungeons and dragons when i was like maybe i don't know um 11 or 12 um my my parents however outright rejected this because you know satanic panic um they still oh, held really? held true to this idea that like it's devil worship and like if your character dies in the game then you're gonna fucking kill yourself in real life oh um, really that, it went that, that far weird. wow oh yeah no um and if, if i'm on another time i can i can give you i can give you a a, a history on satanic panic it was a wild time That's um amazing. and some people still like adhere to that 
but um, but yeah yeah so um so i wasn't allowed to play D, and this this led to like um um a um i have been diagnosed with autism so um okay. i'm autistic and and uh but anyway uh having <laughs> being un, being un, unable to explore um D and D led to like a hyper focus on mm-hmm. uh D and D. Um and and eventually I, I um went more into the just miniature wargaming route by a company called uh Games Workshop. Um they produced a game called Warhammer 40k that oh, I was yeah. primarily interested in, but that wasn't okay because again with my parents, um it didn't have like a, a black and white like this is a, the, these are the good guys, these are the bad guys. It was more of a like neutral gray areas of like Mm-hmm. Some guys are really bad and some guys are really good, but most of them are somewhere in between. Um, so that wasn't that wasn't okay. But then Lord of the Rings Strategy Battle game came out uh, right around when the Fellowship, or actually, I guess it was a while after the Fellowship. Anyway, um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I decided it. Um, and I got into that. I, uh, I tricked cool. them and got into miniature gaming through that. And then <laughs> I, I started uh, sculpting to modify the pieces I worked on. Um, I guess I've kind of always worked in a 3D medium um, from a very young age, just going to like uh, different art classes and went on being pretty good at sculpting. But um, but yeah, and then I got into miniature sculpting and I've been doing that a lot uh, since then. Um, yeah. And I, I work with a number of different, different artists, um, some of them from places like Poland and some from uh, Texas um, on, on these art pieces and uh I, I sculpt a good many myself, but um, a good many as in a multitude, not many as in shorthand for a miniature. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I am. Uh, but I also work with with a number of different different artists. Um, so that's that's been cool, and I'm looking forward to uh, to pursuing that more in the future. That's really cool. So as so I, I would imagine that when you're getting into especially ones that ha- that already have a uh, standing lore and 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 probably even graphic novels and stuff like that with things like the, the Warhammer and stuff. Um, I imagine you kind of have to tailor your, uh, your style when you're making these minis and, and even the, the, I'm sure the, the, the color schemes and stuff for the, the, the way that you paint it somewhat towards the, the, the history of it. So like, how, how do you, how do you bridge that between like, you know, what your instinct would be for, for something versus what you think the game might call for? Sure. Yeah. Um, like all, all of the pieces that I produce through Garage Studios and everything, those are like purely like my oh IP okay and everything. Um, but um and like they've they've basically, <laughs> I'll I'll go into the background of my game another time because I don't <laughs> sure I don't want to take too much of your time. But um, but yeah um, but when when I'm working with like with a client um like as a contract sculpture a contract artist um. I'll yeah I'll look at what they what they provide and uh, if it's like something that they went sculpted if they've provided any concept art or reference images then I'll uh, I'll follow that as as much as I'm I'm able and then um and then with painting pretty much the same thing like a lot of the times people um if they're wanting to get like their armies painted or whatever uh they'll have a specific idea for how they want them to look or especially if they have a pre-existing condition they'll want like these certain colors to go uh along with everything else they have so i'll just i'll just follow what they what they tell me pretty much um but if i'm if i'm painting on my own though i do prefer to like go for a large uh variety of like individual characters and monsters Mm -hmm. and and whatnot uh so i i i don't really have to follow that that uniformity for myself so much but uh but um yeah thank you yeah um I know sometimes in, in arts, like I, I do nature photography uh, myself. Oh, cool. um, I know a lot of times if you, if you have that kind of those, some of those outside constraints, um, it can really um, uh, juice up, I guess, for lack of a better word, like, like get your creative juices going, I should say. Um, it, it, rather than being constraining, it can be uh, kind of freeing in a way. Would, would you say that you find that with, with doing these sorts of models? As far as um, it being freeing to to follow your to own instincts on it, oh, oh, when you're working with with other artists, I was thinking more like, or if if you have different constraints, like uh, you know, it fits into a certain uh, what what another person has has created or whatever. Oh sure, yeah. Um, 
<laughs> I, I, mm, I don't do necessarily feel that okay. way. I feel kind cool. of the, the opposite way. But it, I mean, it is sort of, um, it's nice to be able to work within those constraints just to like mm -hmm. test yourself. Um, but yeah, I definitely, I definitely prefer to be able to uh, make whatever the fuck I want, basically. Yeah. Um, All right. So, so whereas when working with another another client, of course, I'm going to put their their what they need and what they want done um, above, like you know what I would what I think would would be cool or what I would do if it was just me doing it on my own. Um, but yeah, yeah. So kind of kind of the opposite way. But that's cool that you feel that way. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's that's awesome. You can just be completely free form and 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 just run with it. That's that's really cool. Um, do, do you have a a, a favorite uh, race of, of fantastical creatures that you or 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 humanoids or whatever that you uh, prefer to sculpt or or paint or whatever? Yeah. Um. I like I like working with um. <laughs> I guess I like working with uh, various like uh, monsters are cool, um, just because like like big big monsters with lots of uh, flesh and all of clothing. Um, uh -huh. I mean, as uh -huh. newsy, I guess, but also because uh, uh -huh. because just just the the fact that you have so much more like skin tones and natural mm. textures to and open areas to deal with, it presents a, a very different um, sort of challenge. Um, and especially if you're essentially like inventing that anatomy and trying to figure out how it would work and how the mus musculature would be, um, it presents a much different challenge than uh, following like human anatomy, like a fully clothed human mm -hmm. is going to, both from a sculpting and painting perspective, um, is going to be different than hmm. than uh, a, a large creature with like large open spaces that you're essentially having, especially when, when applying uh, color through painting. Um the the way that you do that is um is a lot different because you have to worry about the light and the shadow and the way the colors yeah. interact a, a lot more than if someone's like wearing uh armor and a cloak or something yeah along those lines. i gotta imagine like uh heavily armored guys get kind of monotonous after a while yeah yeah that's that's kind of the reason why like i i entirely avoid um the large like the some games have like really large requirements as far as like the amount of dudes, the, the amount of miniatures mm -hmm. that you need to, to, in order to like have a fully playable army. Cause at the end of the day, these uh, for the most part are meant for like uh, specific games. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I play pretty, pretty specifically uh, skirmish games and, and I, I even the games that I develop and produce um, there and, and that I'm working on uh, they're all, they're all skirmish games as well, just cause um just because I, I like the the variety of working from one character to another and like just being able to put in time on specific on specific models and stuff, mm -hmm. having to worry about trying to put in under two hours per model on like an army of two hundred plus dudes or whatever. Ooh, that adds up quick, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. Wow, that's got to be really magnificent though when like you you actually get it out to to a, a map or whatever a terrain. And you get to see them oh, yeah. all assembled, and and like you know that you've done, you've put in so many hours to each little one. That's got to be really gratifying to look back and and see that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is like a fully painted army is definitely like the, that's the the main thing that like uh, tabletop miniature games has going for it. I I feel is that like versus like PC games um, is just like the amount of yourself because these these miniatures are um, certainly from my own company and then from other companies quite often they're presented uh provided uh unpainted so it's mm -hmm. it's the the hobbyist the consumer that goes in and they like basically put a part of themselves into it in terms of determining taking part in that creative process uh cool. taking it from like bare resin or metal or plastic into a fully realized unit or character or what have you um and then just seeing them across the tabletop battlefield that's like similarly uh detailed is like it's quite good. Yeah, the the aesthetics are excellent, and the tactile nature is is probably what yeah, it has yeah. above uh, PC gaming. And in in my own mind, as as someone who like really likes PC games. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh man, I used to get into those uh, real time strategy games all the time. I remember uh, um, Warcraft three came out when I was a freshman in college, and I don't think I slept for like a week <laughs> when that came out. I nice. Just, it was it was continuous like that. You know, I love that sort of thing. That really immersive story and and you know, not just having one hero to control, but having the strategy be in the dynamics between each of them. That, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, thank you. 
Yeah. All right. So, so once again, if you, if you want to check out uh, Jared's work, you can just go to Derage Studios on Facebook. That's a D E R A J A J studios for those of you who are listening right. to the podcast. And then there's also seize the minis, uh, of pro painted that's P R O painted. Uh, and, and you can check out Jared's work there as well. So I want to thank you again for, for being my guest tonight and for, you know, having a really fun free ranging conversation as, as, as we like to do on this stream. Um, so, so thank you very much for, for coming in tonight and, uh, you know, donating your time to the, the cause of helping educate people about uh, theory. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. I really, um, really enjoyed it. It was good, good being able to, um, to talk more with you and um, yeah, yeah, to was, go over these, these different concepts. Yeah, it was, it was also nice to, to finally uh, chat with you, um, not, uh, not quite in person, but, but at least, you know, uh, over, the, over the voice. Not, right, yeah. not just be uh, pixels on a screen to interact with. So that was cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, well, thank you. I, I hope this is uh, the, the first of many conversations we get to have about theory and, and, and about uh, just leftist politics in general. So, so I look forward to our next conversation. Um, and, and again, I just thank you for your time and, and have a wonderful night, Jared. Same. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. All right, and that was Jared Anderson, my guest tonight. And what we covered was uh, The Conquest of Red, Chapter 11. Uh, even though it was a short one, we, we managed to flesh it out to the, the two-hour mark with some, some really good conversation. Um, so I hope you join us uh, next week if you enjoy this sorts of thing. I, I stream Theory every Friday night at 7 p.m. Uh, you can go to my link tree if you want to follow me in the various places that I do stuff. You can get links to my my Twitch, of course, uh, also my YouTube. I put this out as a podcast on Anchor. And then I have uh, a Facebook page as well as a couple different Facebook groups that deal with um, just leftism in general. I have Left Signal Boost and then also Left Pod uh, Left Pod Posting, which deals with leftist podcasts. And, and we've been... Uh, streaming live, uh, uh, just a, a, a series of, of leftist podcasts almost every day. I've been keeping up with it. Uh, so you can always uh, like the companion page of, of uh, Left Pod Posting if you're interested in learning some more, learning about some more leftist podcasts and, and joining in, in the discussion there live. Um, and otherwise, uh, I'll, I'll thank you all for joining me tonight.